Right, well, we might get started. Um, and I want to welcome you to meet the researcher. This is a forum for you to learn more about the research in progress at the Westmead Institute for Medical Research, or WIMA, as we like to call ourselves. And it provides you with the opportunity to hear some of our world leading researchers firsthand and ask questions about their work. My name is Nicola Tuck, and I am the Strategic Partnerships Manager at WIMA, working with many diverse organizations who are supporting the important research work being done here. It gives me great pleasure to be facilitating our session today. I would like to acknowledge that we are here at Westmead on the land of the Darug people, who are the traditional owners of this land where Westmead Health Precinct resides. Wherever you are joining us today, we acknowledge the present Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who now reside within this area and yours and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Before I introduce our speakers today, I would like to tell you a little bit about WIMA and our work here at Westmead. WIMA is proud to be pioneering precision medicine, approaches to disease prevention and treatment. We continue to invest in critical infrastructure, technology, and most importantly, the people who will transform the future of healthcare. Precision medicine uses detailed information about the specific characteristics of an individual's disease, along with their unique genetic profile, to develop a treatment plan for the best health outcomes. It is an approach powered by the discovery of the human genome, access to immense quantities of clinical and de demographic data. The last two years have seen global awareness of the importance of medical research on global health. I think most people today will appreciate the medical research that's gone before with life-saving discoveries such as penicillin, insulin, and more recently COVID vaccines. The last two years have seen global awareness and about medical um, discoveries. And of course, um, all of these discoveries have taken time to come to fruition, as we know. As Isaac Newton famously wrote in 1675, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. In terms of Westmead, um, we have an, an incredible advantage here um, in precision medicine. Westmead is a leading health education, research and training precinct in Australia and is central to the development of employment and business opportunities within the Western Sydney region. Based in Westmead, the epicenter of Western Sydney, an integral part of the Westmead Health Precinct. Population of 2.5 million representing 50% of the New South Wales state economy and the third largest economic region in Australia. It's the most ethnically diverse population in Australia and we have the largest urban Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community as well. WIMA has over 30 clinician scientists offering bench to bedside and back to bench translational advantage. Westmead Health Precinct is home to two of the largest teaching hospitals in the state, four research institutes, the University of Sydney is closely aligned with WIMA, and the CSIRO has recently located here, providing broad expertise in genomics, bioinformatics, and of course, big data. In the session today, we will be exploring precision medicine at its best, research led by Professor John Aradell around phage therapy, the therapeutic use of bacteriophages for the treatment of pathogenic bacterial infections. He and his research team at Wimmer are exploring the use of phage therapy, a practice that was used for centuries until antibiotics became widely available about 90 years ago. In fact, nature's own cure, you would say. In an increasingly connected world, this is a global issue for all species on the planet. Even Antarctic penguins have antibiotic resistance, John tells me. He will outline how phage therapy may be the key to solving the looming superbug crisis. Our two speakers today bring a wealth of knowledge and expertise to their field. Professor Jonathan Ardell is an infectious disease physician and microbiologist who divides his time between Westmead Hospital and the Combined Infectious Diseases and Microbiology Department and his research, which is supported by the NHMRC and the University of Sydney and at WIMA. He is a fellow of the Australian Society for Microbiology and was ASM president from 2014 to 16. 
He leads the newly established Fires Australia initiative. He's joined today with his colleague, Dr. Jessica Satcher, co-founder of the Farge Directory, Farge Microbiologist at Westmead Institute for Medical Research and Farge Australia. Dr. Satcher holds a PhD in Microbiology and Biotechnology from the University of Alberta, Canada. She co-founded Farge Directory, a global Farge finding network in 2017. She has since directed Farge Directory's sourcing and community building, leading to 40 Farge finding efforts where 1,200 plus members of the global Farge community volunteer their time and lab space to find Farges for patients in need. Three of these Farge hunts have led to successful patient treatments, including one here in Australia, which she will discuss. In 2022, she moved to Sydney to work at Wimmer with the Iredell Lab as part of Farge Australia, where they're helping adapt the Farge finding system to Australian needs. We'll now hear from John and Jessica. Thank you. Thanks, Melinda. I'll just untangle my glasses. I can see what I'm doing and I'll share screen. Hi everyone and um, thanks for coming. Now I hope and Nicola, um, we've got full screen now. Not quite. Not quite. You just need to click on the little um there we go. It's a little, little thing at the bottom. Yes, yep. well done. There we go. Right. Thanks. Yeah, so hi everyone. We've we've had an introduction from Nicola. As um, as she pointed out, I'm a physician at the hospital. So if you get a horrible infection, it's someone like me who will be looking after you. And one of the issues I've been concerned about for a long time is that um, antibiotics are not working as well anymore, and we need some new solutions. So um, I'm lucky enough to work with people like Jessica who. Jessica, we first met, goodness, it must have been a few years ago when we reached out to you to try and find a solution to treat someone who we'll talk about in a second. But um, you've you've been with us here at Westmead just for this year, but you've got a long, a long background in phage biology and finding solutions for people who need to be treated when antibiotics aren't working anymore. So I guess we should start with that because it's surprising perhaps to me, but not to others, perhaps that antibiotic resistance is not known to be the threat that the specialists recognise that it is. So we know that at the moment, um, unless we do something new about the antibiotic resistance crisis, that is the adaptation of bacteria to antibiotics, that antibiotic resistant infection will be the leading cause of death within a couple of decades, more than all deaths due to cancer, more than all deaths due to heart disease. At the moment, uh, it's expected that as many people are dying every year from antibiotic resistant infection as have ever died from COVID. And if you added up these numbers, it's hard to, hard to imagine this, but if you could imagine a jumbo jet crashing every half hour or so, constantly, every day, every night, every week, every year. That's the amount of deaths we are losing right now to antibiotic resistance. And that number is steadily increasing. Margaret Chan, and this is a while ago, so people have known about this for some time. Margaret Chan, who was the then Director General of the World Health Organization, said, this is eight years ago, that antibiotic resistance is such a threat that if we do nothing, it could mean the end of modern medicine because we need it to support our transplantation, our big surgery, our joint replacements, our intensive care units. Everything we do is dependent on our ability to fight infection. But, of course, bacteria have been on Earth since long before humans. And so, as you would expect, there is a natural control system that exists in nature. Um, so these little green lunar lander things are the natural predators of bacteria. So the bacteria, just to, I guess, remind us all, these are the germs that live in us and all around us, 
and make up most of the biomass, if you like, on Earth, and are really important in us to maintain our healthy relationship with the rest of the planet. And we need it to keep ourselves healthy. But occasionally, one of these bacteria will get into a place that doesn't belong, like our bloodstream or somewhere else where we really don't like them to live. They normally live on our skin, in our gut. They're really important there, but we don't like them really in our bloodstream and they can cause mischief in there. We have a bunch of systems, our immune system, that's designed to deal with them and it's very effective, but it can be overwhelmed. And some bacteria are particularly good at overwhelming it. And they're the famous ones that you know, we think about that cause threats, you know, the, the golden staff or some types of E. coli, the things that we might read about or hear about nasty stories, including the very famous ones through the ages, like the Black Death, the Plague Bacillus. These are the bacterial predators we worry about. And as we have increasingly exposed the planet's ecosystems to antibiotics and all the byproducts of human expansion on the planet, a lot of these bacteria have adapted. But long before we came along, long before humans evolved, certainly hundreds of millions of years ago, perhaps billions of years ago, there were viruses that specialised in attacking bacteria. And we believe that these viruses are essential to control bacterial populations in nature. Otherwise, I mean, everything in nature has checks and balances and the checks on bacteria are these predatory viruses. And these viruses, they're not like COVID or influenza. Those viruses, like, they're like humans, they attack our cells. These viruses are not interested in us. But of course, as you might sort of predict, because there are much more bacteria on Earth and because bacteria here were, were here long before we were, these viruses that attack bacteria are much, much more numerous than the viruses that attack humans. And in fact, these viruses that attack bacteria, the so-called bacteriophages or bacteria eaters, these little viruses are thought to be the most numerous and diverse life form on Earth. So it is said that all of the phages on Earth, the bacteriophages, these bacterial viruses, are greater in number than all other organisms combined. So they're the most important living entity on Earth. They're very silent to us because they're innocent around us and they were here before we evolved. So we've grown up with them. Um, they're part of the world we live in. We don't notice them. As I said, they're innocent around us. They're everywhere. We're used to them. They kill bacteria very quickly. This is a, an unfortunate E. coli, which is this, if you can imagine, like a, a rugby football or an Aussie rules football, depending on what your, what, your, what your interests are, but this sort of ovoid shape that's completely busted open here, full of these little white things popping out of them. These white things are virus particles. So one of these little lunar landers has got in, injected the little DNA. I think you can imagine a little green tail being injected and all the DNA has already left this one. And once that happens, these take over the cell and very quickly start making more viruses and break the cell open. If you use them as a therapeutic tool, which people have been doing for a while, and you use them with antibiotics, they actually make the antibiotics more powerful. And when antibiotics aren't working, which is one of the things we're really worried about for the future, these guys still work because they're not affected by the way bacteria resist antibiotics. It's a totally different system. So in other words, antibiotic resistant infection is equally well treated by these little viruses as antibiotic sensitive infection. So, I guess it's no surprise that when a famous British economist, Lord Jim O'Neill, was asked by the was commissioned by the UK government to look at antimicrobial resistance, the risk to the country, the risk to the world indeed. And this report 
is widely available. You can just Google review on antimicrobial resistance and you should be able to get it easily. This was published in 2016. And this pointed out that these little viruses, these bacteriophages are the best solution to antibiotic failure that is present now occasionally and increasingly problematic because they're the natural control system for bacteria in nature and because they've been here since long before humans evolved. And importantly, we know how to use them now. So their history goes back quite a while. The first time they were used was in 1919 to treat a boy who had dysentery, I think, Jess, um, if that's right. And that was very successful therapy and they were used, it said their heyday were the 20s and 30s and um, then antibiotics uh, and the industrial era arrived and they sort of became the most important anti-infective therapy. And phages continued to be used therapeutically and have been used all throughout that time, really, in places like Poland and Georgia, where it's perfectly legal to use them. But they're regarded as an experimental therapy, therapy in many countries, including in Australia. And part of the problem with them has been that we've had trouble targeting them in the past. And the reason for that is because you can imagine these things have evolved for hundreds of millions, if not billions of years, they're very specialised. And so if you have one golden staff or one E. coli that you want to kill, you need a specific phage to kill it with. And you have to know how to find that phage and how to choose it uh, to treat someone with. So that has been difficult in the past, but of course now with the modern computers and information systems and DNA sequencing, all this stuff that we've now come to take for granted in medicine, which we use routinely in medicine now, it's actually easy to use these kinds of things. And you use them much like an antibiotic. So this is, this is Danby. Um, da this is, Danby was actually on TV and is, is sort of a bit of a publicised success story. She's one of the most recent people we met. And in fact, this is how we met Jessica, who um, maybe you could tell the story a bit, Jess. I mean, we contacted you, or in fact, Dr. Amani Katami, who is, the, is one of our colleagues at the Children's Hospital who works with us very closely, was yeah. contacted and asked for a solution and she reached out to us. So we reached out to you, Jess. I don't know if you remember that contact. Yeah, yeah. In 2019. So mm. crazy. That was three years ago already. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we had been doing some of these sort of sage hunts uh, for whoever, whoever emailed us and had the right sort of situation that we thought we could find phages to help with, um, we would we would do our best to <laughs> see if anybody, any of the phage researchers in our network would be willing to and have the right phages to help. So you guys emailed us and it was, I remember Pseudomonas and that one, we, you know, we were like, okay, usually when we have a Pseudomonas um, bacteria to find phages against, that's one of the easier ones because a lot of people study phages against Pseudomonas. Um, but we had never had an alert from Australia before. And we were in the US at the time and most of our alerts came from Europe or the US. Um, and so we were like, oh, I don't know if anybody's gonna be willing to mail you phages all the way over there. So please have no hope that this will work, but we'll send out the phage alert anyway. So we did. Um, and then we got like the best response we've ever had in 12 labs from 12 countries. Like there were no duplicate countries. <laughs> I was like watching it come in and. I was like, oh, Canada, US, Israel, everywhere. And um, they all said, yeah, I'll help, I'll help. No problem if it's in Australia. So that's, um, so we kind of, the next thing we do in those cases is we just put everybody in touch by email. Um, and so we put them in touch with you guys. And I think we spammed your email inbox a lot. <laughs> and you're like, Here, here's another one, here's another one. Here's another lab. And everybody's like, I've got a hundred pages. I've got 10 pages. and. Um, and the other thing to mention is the, the big thing that we do is we get the actual patient bacteria to be shipped out to all these labs so that they can actually check if their phages work. Um, and we have to do that test before we know which one will work. So there was a lot of mailing going on. And I think you guys, I don't even know what it was like on the ground at your end, but I was just sending emails and <laughs> then 
actually a couple months later than you guys said, hey, it worked. <laughs> so that's pretty crazy. But yeah, I mean, it was like six weeks, I think, from go to woe. So yeah, he contacted you. And the story was Danvi had um, gone home to visit relatives uh, in India just on holidays or school holidays. And she got knocked over by a car, the poor thing, and ended up in hospital with two broken legs and a lot of hardware and ended up getting a nasty infection that really antibiotics weren't working on. And she was back in Australia. She'd been in and out of hospital for ages. I think it was nearly a year that she'd been on the drip. And that photograph slightly blurred out on the left is her in hospital, probably scratching her itchy drip site. Um, it was dreadful, really, and it was clearly failing. The infection was getting worse, and it had got to the point where the doctors had said, um, look, to deal with this pain and chronic infection, we may have to consider amputation. And that's a pretty big deal in a 70-year-old. And that's why I think they contacted Amine and us, and that's why we contacted Jess. And Jess, you sourced, the best phage I think was sourced from Israel. It was purified in New York shipped to us, we gave it to Danvi, and it was amazing, really. Um, here she is on the right-hand side. Here she is about a year later. As far as we know, and we're now a good year down the track, she's off all her antibiotics. She's back at school. She's just leading a normal life. So we think that was a cure, but it was a cure that was affected really purely by phage therapy because although we did use the antibiotics, it was clear the antibiotics weren't working. Um, so it, it was a really instructive lesson of how successful you can be. And I think, Jess, it showed how much enthusiasm, that enthusiasm there is, isn't it, that, that we were able to make that call. And within six weeks, we had, as you said, a dozen labs from all around the world, all wanting to help and a fantastic outcome. And so for us, it's about the clinical outcome, but for many of us, it's also about the science. So, of course, this was uh, carefully analysed and published in you know, the scientific literature because it's very important to follow these stories. This um, is a similar story. Uh, this is Rebecca. She's also a bit of a TV star now. Um, and she went recently at the Institute, in fact. Rebecca had a really nasty chest infection. Um, she's got problems with cystic fibrosis, which is, I'm sure as many people are aware, are not uncommon problem. It's in fact, I think, one of the most common inherited um, problems in, in countries like Australia. And one of the consequences of this is nasty chest infections. And Rebecca had a, a progressive chest infection that antibiotics were simply failing to control. And this can be a problem in this and in many other types of illnesses. And she had bacteriophages as well. The previous story with Dunby, she just had one phage, didn't she, Jess? But with Rebecca, we actually used a couple of phages. And interestingly, these, these were genetically modified phages. So they're not natural ones, or they were originally natural ones, but they had been genetically modified to work better. And she had a great outcome. This is, um, this is Rebecca with the soccer coach. Uh, so she had several months of therapy after years in and out of hospital and now she's also about six months down the track off all her antibiotics back at school playing soccer it's just a great success story we've actually got a lot of these success stories we've treated i think probably in australia at this one site we've treated as many as anyone has at a single site i think um, and so our mission now with with our team, Jessica and I, and all our colleagues, is to try and make this uh, cost effective, to make this part of normal therapy. And one of the things I thought about recently, and don't think about this very often, is what it costs to make therapy. So if you look back at what the Australian government has paid for on the um, prescribe a benefit schedule. So these is, you know, when you go to the chemist and you give them a script and you just pay a dispensing fee, and you probably know the drug that you're being given for the $16 dispensing fee or $25 from the chemist is actually might be $600 or $1,000 worth of drug, but that's 
that's subsidized by the taxpayer. And that's one of the reasons why we, we think we have a really good uh, therapeutic system here in Australia, but it's controlled centrally. And it, it's hard to judge what you think is worth paying for and what you think is not worth paying for, but you can deduce it by looking back at what the government has said, okay, the taxpayer should stump up for this. So we call this the willingness to pay and the health economists use this, use this concept of a quality adjusted life year. So that's, if you can imagine that you have a treatment, but it leaves you very disabled for a year or in a lot of pain for a year, that's different to a treatment that cures a child that then has another 70 years of life as if they have never had an infection. So you can see from a hard-nosed health economist point of view, um, when they're trying to justify health expenditure to the taxpayer, that they have to use these kind of equations. So they use this concept of the quality adjusted life year. And I think of it as the price of a year of good health. And so it looks, when you look back, you can see that um, the price that the Australian government thinks the taxpayer is comfortable with for this sort of thing would mean that intensive care services are really good value. Coronary artery bar bypass grafting is not as good value. That kidney transplantation, bone marrow transplant, they're really good value. So for every bone marrow transplant, you pay the equivalent of about $4,000 to get a quality adjusted life years worth of benefits somewhere in the population. I know it's a bit of an abstract concept, but it, it's a rough way to understand these things. I mean, there's many or other variables, but it does give you a benchmark. And some things, of course, you just, you feel like you have to deal with, and sometimes they turn out not to be very good value for money. So, you know, the COVID antivirals, for example, um, you know, they're probably not as great an investment as something like ICU services or bone marrow transplantation or kidney transplantations. But the point I'm trying to make here is that if you look at the cost of of the, if you look at the price you pay to get the benefits from phage therapy, it's right down there with ICU and bone marrow transplant and well inside this sort of artificial number, which is about equivalent to what the government would probably say is good value for money. So the punchline here is that phage therapy looks like really good value for money on the basis of the data we have at the moment. So we wanted to stop at that point and give people a chance to ask questions. Jess, are there any things that you think we should have, um, we should have highlighted? Are there any from that that you think need to be highlighted or points you'd like to add? I think, um, I think you covered a lot of it. I think we can go to the questions, but maybe as they come up, we'll jump in with more. Yes, so please, if you have some questions, pop them in the Q&A chat box there. We have had uh, some questions come through um, <clears throat> already. Um, John, I'm interested to know, uh, do you have patients waiting now for phage therapy um, when all other treatments have failed? Yes, we do, unfortunately. Um, Jess, we have, I don't know, probably a couple of dozen, I think, on our waiting list at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things we need to do, and I think this is one of the bottlenecks at the moment, is production. Um, yeah. So I think it's it's interesting to reflect, and maybe you can comment on this. Um, but Dr. Satch's experience before has been that people like us would contact her and say, "Can you give us some phage?" And our expectation. If you imagine me just as the doctor at the bedside saying, I want something to treat my patient with, I want someone like Jessica to send me an email saying, hey, I'm sending you a vial of this triple purified stuff and it's going to work and it's clean and it's fantastic and it's safe to use. But to actually get to that point is a big deal. And so yeah. we have been leaning, haven't we, on, on goodwill. And that goodwill was, I think the point Jessica made before was that that goodwill was a little bit overwhelming. We were all a bit moved by it, I think, weren't we, when we reached out for Danby? Yeah. 
you get yeah. in all sorts of all sorts of levels, don't you? I mean, people prepare it differently. That's the thing. Yeah, it's like when we started out, you know, when we started Phage Directory, this whole matching service. I was a grad student. I didn't know anything about anything clinical. I was just doing biology in the lab. But my computationally literate friend at the time, Jan, who was the co-founder of Phage Directory, he was the one who pointed out that, uh, oh, there's like, you know, we could set up a system that actually works for this and help people um, connect with, like help the doctors connect with the researchers like yours, like he was referring to mine because I was working mm. with these things in the lab. But we have no idea about the clinical side. And that's the case for most phage researchers. And so we we did the matching system. The doctors are happy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And we're just going kind of, we just started from zero being like, okay, well, we'll just put people in touch. But then we realized we had to think about, okay, what is the quality standards that we have to maintain? And we don't know what the standard is, but nobody knows what the standard is as we started to learn. Um, and so anyone you ask, if you ask a researcher, like, how do you know if your phage is going to be good for a patient? If they've never worked with anything clinical, they they have no idea and they don't want to go there. They're like, ugh, I don't want to get sued if my something's wrong with this. I'm not a pharmacist and that's fair. And so um, we ended up finding that um, the best thing for us was step one, just like find sources of phages, even if they're dirty, just who has them. We have to find something that hits the patient isolate and kills it in the dish. And so we could get to that point. And then if we do find good hits, then we kind of have a secondary search for somebody who can purify that to clinical grade, we sort of call it. And that is very few labs around the world. It's usually biotech companies that are almost becoming pharmaceutical companies. So they know how to make pharmaceutical grade products and they also donate their time to kind of do the cleanup. But it's so rare that um, that one of our phage hunts kind of leads all the way to like finding the patient's phage and the patient has to live that long and often they don't. So, so many things have to happen for us to even get to that point. But usually we've been saved by some company volunteering to do the purification at the end or a lab figuring out kind of um, how to purify it and then getting the regulator on the phone like TGA here or FDA in the US and, and then kind of a back and forth of what tests should we do for quality. But it's so, you know, it's clear. I hope it's clear yes. that it's different. We're not, we're researchers. We're not trying to be clinical pharmacists or anything, but um, if there's nothing else, this is kind of what we've been trying to do, but it's a, a big hurdle figuring out the cleanup yeah. step and yeah. So there's some questions coming through and um, everybody's very keen to know. Um, uh, here's one from Bevan, what's needed to take this from where it is um, now to being frontline therapy? Um, and a lot mm. of uh, questions are coming through asking, um, you know, how far off is it being available yeah, to, the, yeah, to the common Yeah, area? well, first question is um, how do we get there? So one thing we have done is assemble all the collective wisdom of Australia in infectious diseases and microbiology and ask them that question. We've, we've done some surveys and we've got another one open at the moment that's a follow-up which is basically saying, well, what do you think we need to do to make this available in the hospitals? What, what are the disease we need to focus on? So we know what all the infection experts, the people like me who are at the bedside want to treat and need to treat. We also know how to do it because we've actually made phages ourselves. What we don't have is the classic setup that Jesse was talking about before, that is the production system. So there's there's, there are a set of protocols and systems that are normally applied to production of a therapeutic product, which as you can imagine, are, are very rigorous. You want to be sure that something is safe. It has to be a, a highly regimented quality controlled system. And to set that system up is expensive. And that is actually the principal bottleneck at the moment. We do have, although it's true to say we don't have a very formalized international consensus, we do definitely have safety standards that are applied. And those standards, uh, I mean, we produce when, when we make a product, we would produce a document that describes it in the way that the pharmacist at the hospital is satisfied by and can certify that this product is safe to give to a person. And so, that kind of know-how is in place. 
what is missing is the actual production. Um, yeah, so we, we kind of know what to do and we know how to do it, but it's expensive to set up. It's like all of these things that's starting that's, that's difficult. And once you get up and running and you start to reach those economies of scale, you can see it's going to be cost effective, but you have to take that first, that first jump because there's no, I think there's one GMP facility at the moment in the Northern Hemisphere, Jess. There's, there's, I know there's the facility in Slovenia. I think there's the San Diego group has got, you know, this is Armata. They've got a certified plant or close to certification. I think APT are close as well. But there's nothing in the Southern Hemisphere. So we really lack a production capacity. That's, that's crucial. Um, and how long will it take to do that? If we had, so for example, obviously we're, we're trying to prosecute this argument in, in all the appropriate places and, and we have a lot of interested support, but um, if we are able to get hold of the funds to do this, it would take probably two or three years to get a true GMP classic production plant operating, but injections of funds could probably get us up and running, I would think, by the end of the year. But it, it's really just that bottleneck of production. Yeah, definitely. So many good questions. So, so <laughs> many great questions coming through, mm. but very much about the production and the availability mm -hmm. and how quickly it could come about mm. um, and what's needed um, and and so on. So uh, could you give us some examples, John, yeah. of um, when you would be applying Farges? I, I have heard you before speak about um, the need for it with things yeah. like knee replacements, hip replacements, and, and the prevalence of... Um, the need, I guess, that you're yeah. seeing. Yeah, that's a really good question. So at the moment, when people who are familiar with phage therapy think about it, they think about it as a rescue, like it's a last minute thing. It's when everything else has failed, it's an experimental therapy. Now that's partly a product of the regulatory system. In other words, in a country like Australia, you simply can't use an unregulated experimental product when there are regulated, proven medicines that work. And that's exactly how we all want it to be, obviously. So until the regulators of each country say, this is part of your pharmacopoeia, it's not mainstream and will only use, be used as rescue therapy. And that means that we only use it at the last minute when every therapy is most likely to fail. At, but where this needs to be applied is not in stories where um, everything else has failed and it's the last ditch and, you know, that's not its best place. Its best place is probably in scenarios where you want to add firepower to antibiotics because antibiotics, even when they are working, are not always the perfect solution. And in places where antibiotics have acquired resistance, which in Australia about... 12% of patients who come into an emergency department with a severe infection have an infection that is resistant to common hospital antibiotics. Now, if you go to a, a, a place like Delhi and you have leukemia there, they do just as good a job as we do at treating the leukemia, but they can't treat the infection. So now you're more likely to die of infection than cancer if you have leukemia in Delhi. That's not the case here, but there's no doubt that the epicenter of antibiotic resistance development is Asia. WHO has recognised the Asia Pacific as the area of greatest need. So this is um, this is something that we will have to deal with. So just to wind that up, then I think the areas that we need to be using phage therapy is antibiotic resistant infection and antibiotic failure. And antibiotic failure most commonly occurs in settings like chronic infections of the lungs and artificial joints. So if you look at the amount of things that we currently rely on, pacemakers, um, light, plastic lines into the bloodstream to give cancer therapy, artificial hips, artificial knees, 
we need to protect these things from infection and antibiotics don't do a good job, but it appears that phages do a better job. We actually um, commissioned a, a professional health economics or what we, uh, what we call a health technology analysis of this question. And they found that if in 2019, we had had phages available for everybody who had infection related failure of an artificial hip or knee joint, which is pretty common, then we would have saved nearly 2000 unnecessary operations, more than 300 premature deaths, and something like $120 million in the health system. That was just 2019, just for artificial hips and knees that got, anti that got antibiotic failure. So it's pretty obvious that those sort of settings are a bit of a, a no-brainer, but they also add firepower to antibiotics, and it is very likely that once we prove that to be the case, they will become what we call adjunct therapy. So... I'm dreadfully ill, I'm going to get some antibiotics in the emergency department. But if I know that I can use a phage, that it's safe and it's effective and it improves my likelihood of success, I'll use that as well. And the other big application is prevention of infection. So this is a healthy way to get rid of infection. Um, I know you are about to ask me a question, but I'll just finish this last. And, and I think the best way to illustrate this is to remind everyone that the golden staph, which is one of the commonest of all human infections, is present in 30% of us roughly at any given time. So I don't know how many people are on this call. Let's say there's 100. It means 30 people on this call have currently got golden staph on their skin, up their noses. And that's fine there. But if it gets into your blood or your artificial knee, it will cause terrible grief. So when you have a big operation, we give you an antibiotic to try and stop it getting in. But if we can use something like phages, which are natural, to prevent it, we'd use them. We think that the reason that these things like golden staff come and go from people, so you might have it today, but you probably won't have it in three weeks' time, is because phages just drip through microbial communities and just clear them out as they go. There's this constant waxing and waning of bacterial populations, and phages are the control systems in nature. We've had a few questions um, on how do you actually administer the phage? And I know there are various ways that you do that. Yeah, um, we use it like an antibiotic. So any way you can give an antibiotic, you can give a phage. We here have given it by vein, mostly, uh, by inhalation, by direct injection into a cavity, uh, like a bladder or chest or even the airways. Um, you can drink it. You can put it on a wound. Anything you can do with an antibiotic, you can do with a bacteriophage. It wouldn't look any different if you handed a vial to a nurse. They wouldn't know the difference until you told them that there were viruses in there. And is antibiotic resistance um, something that, that individuals sort of are predisposed to, or can any of us at any time have, have that present? Yeah, what a good question. Um, look, I think um, it's, it's certainly true that some people are more likely to meet hospitals, to meet antibiotics. And so those people who spend a lot of time in hospitals and healthcare and who have a lot of antibiotic um, themselves, their natural bacterial ecosystem, which is mostly in your gut, but also on your skin and everywhere else, they adapt. Of course they adapt. I mean, you know, they're either going to die or they're going to adapt, aren't they? And so that means by definition that the bacteria that are there are the bacteria that have survived antibiotics. And that means, yes, you're more likely to have antibiotic resistance. But if you're out there walking down the street, you haven't seen a doctor for ages, you haven't been in the hospital, you know, you're not particularly at high risk of getting antibiotics. If you go traveling to a country that has a high level of antibiotic resistance, and we gave the example of India before, then it's quite common to come back with antibiotic resistant bacteria that you picked up there because you exchange bugs all the time with all the people around you, the surfaces, cats and dogs, everyone. I mean, that's just, that's natural and normal. So if you go to a place where antibiotic resistant bacteria are really common, 
then you will bring them home with you. And when you bring them home, we think that an antibiotic resistant E. coli that you bring home with you will hang around for probably, typically around six months. And it's just an exchange. It gradually just sort of dilutes out. Of course, we all experienced some of this with the COVID um, situation yeah. and probably, mm. you know, heightened our awareness of the fact that we are very interconnected mm. and can obviously mm. um, pick up things very easily. Um, mm. There's been a couple of questions about um, synthetic phages versus natural. And, and I'm interested to know where they come from because you do mention um, waterways and, um, and sewerage, et cetera. So. so natural phages come from bacteria, basically. That's what they live in. That's what they prey on. If you want to find a wolf, you go looking for sheep. Um, if you want to find a bacteriophage, you go looking for bacteria. And because they're a bit specialised, if you want a phage to treat a certain bug in a person, then you ask yourself the question, where does that bug live in nature? Now, some bugs only live in people, obviously, and we can think of a few examples, in which case you've really got to, got to go looking in a person or the person's environment to get the bug. So you can go to a sewage outlet, you can go to a water treatment plant, you can even go to a river to find the bugs that come from humans, obviously, and the phages that live in them. So we do that sort of thing. Um, if you want to, if you've got someone who's got a bug that actually normally lives in nature or doesn't normally have to live in a human, like the pseudomonas that Jess mentioned before and which we treated Danvi for, or some other more exotic ones, then you have to go to where they live. So we look in the environment sometimes. We have bioprospecting programs. So, for example, um, some of our colleagues have beautifully structured systems that are engaging with traditional owners of land and sea here in Australia, and in partnership, looking to find the healing entities of the sacred places, like sacred waters that are reputed to have healing properties. Now, it may be that the elders will find that some of these are bacteriophages. I mean, this is part of nature after all. So if a humans bathe in healing waters, and this was how bacteriophages were, bacteriophages were first recognised, in fact, in the late 1890s, then um, it's quite likely that that kind of bioprospecting will reveal them. That's fascinating. Mm. Um, question for you, um, Jessica, and probably one that's um, quite interesting for mm. people to hear. You've moved from Canada to join Wimmer and, and John's um, area. What made, motivated you to come here and um, choose, you know, to invest your time and your energy um, here at Westmead, I guess? Yeah, cool question. Um, so with our phage directory work for the last few years, we were kind of agnostic to where, you know, we were kind of virtual and global, just whoever wanted. We were using the internet so we could help anybody. And we we're always kind of looking for how to take our work to the next level because we're trying to make things more efficient so that people have access to phage therapy. But there's so many ways you could do that. And so we were kind of looking at different groups around the world that are getting, we kind of call them like um, pre-phage therapy centers or some of them are already calling themselves phage therapy centers. They have patients coming in, they're doing treatments routinely. Um, and so we were working with a lot of these groups and, um, and John's was one of them. And at, like, it was because first our um, Danby case was actually the first um, successful patient case that worked. And so that was definitely like made us interested in that group, but not just because of that. It was really that they actually were able to mobilize like the local government and like get um, grant funding to get started and going. And the other key is that they um, saw that this, like we do, is a data problem a little bit. And so um, when we think about phages, we think like of Pokemon collecting, if you are a child of the 90s or know someone who was, um, collect, you got to catch them all and you have to know something about them. And it becomes a thing where, an issue where um, it is a big data problem. And how, how do you collect the right data? And how do you learn from the phages so you're um, getting better at picking them faster the next time? And that was like the key area, the next area after figuring out, you know, the matching system and using technology there, we wanted to use 
software and computers to kind of tackle that next thing, which is like, how do we make the Pokédex for all the phages? How do we learn from phages? How do we get this data? And John's group was actually the one that for us was the most clearly actually getting that and seeing it, not just like, oh, we want to make phages one size fits all, but they recognized that data was important and we need to collect Every time we use a phage, we have to, you know, study that patient as they're getting the phage in, in a better way and, and learn from it. So I think we were just excited to see that their group was um, making so much momentum and just like making things happen and getting funding coming in. And a lot of other groups have been trying for decades to do that. And so I kind of, and also Australia sounded cool to come to. So we just thought, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> Well, that's a good enough reason. But at the same time, I think it, it you know, would you say that um, Wimmer and John's work is um, really world leading? And that oh, you're, you're fishing now. Yeah, absolutely. That. Uh, that, that's definitely <laughs> fishing. <laughs> yeah. That's we, what, that's what yeah. you call a leading question. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that I portrayed that without the leading question because that's my long winded way of saying, you know, we looked at all the options for us mm. and uh, we wanted the right partner to like take it to the next level. So this is why we chose John's group. Yep. Well, that's great. And we're very thrilled to have you here. And we're looking, um, you know, to some exciting um, opportunities and developments coming out. Um, so we've had quite a lot of questions. Um, we've, we've answered, you know, across a number, I think. Um, but we will endeavour to get back to the participants that have posted a question if we haven't answered or if you haven't had it uh, explained. Um, and, you know, it's just been so interesting to hear the work um, and to learn about superbugs. Um, it's probably all we have time for today. So thank you, John and Jessica, for such um, interesting and informative discussion on your Farge work and Farge Australia and the Farge directory. And we all wish you the very best with this exciting work. Um, if you'd like to learn more, please contact WIMA at, at our website. Um, and you can reach out and have a discussion about anything you might like to that you've heard today. Um, John's also speaking on Friday in person. So if you happen to be out um, in Westmead, you can hear him. Um, and we've partnered with the Powerhouse. We're doing the Festival of Science and John and some of his colleagues are speaking at those presentations. We're very proud to have um, the staff that we have, very experienced senior researchers, as you've heard today, in the country. We're committed to continuing to attract young scientists, clinician researchers, data analysts, and more who will help us drive the new way of working set to revolutionize the future of health and precision medicine. What we also need is to bring together the community of visionary supporters, such as those people who have been listening today to help us drive forward this terrific work. WIMA has successfully attracted considerable support both from state and federal governments over the years, but we've also achieved a lot through generous donations and contributions of individuals and organisations. Government funding is vitally important, but it only goes so far and it's incredibly competitive. Only apparently 99% of grant applications are successful. And for every dollar of government funding, a further 70 cents is required to support medical research, such as you've heard today. Philanthropic, corporate and community support and engagement is essential if WIMA is to continue to establish itself as a centre of excellence in the design and delivery of precision medicine. So I invite you all to connect with the um, WIMA organisation and the foundation team um, and please uh, reach out to us. My name is actually Nicola Tuck. We had the technical glitch where I had to swap computers. So <laughs> please reach out and we'd love to hear from you. Thank you again, John and Jessica, and for the audience making time to tune in to meet the researcher. I'm sure you've found uh, John and Jessica's work just fascinating. A recording will be sent through to you following um, today's um, webinar, and please feel free to share it with your networks. We'd like you to spread the word of uh, the Wimmer research and the wonderful work that's happening in John and Jessica's area. So thank you all and enjoy your afternoon. Thank you. I've been racing to try to answer some of those questions in the chat. So okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. thanks so much for having us. Bye.